Yo guys, welcome back to the channel. We are here with another basketball video, specifically surrounding the GOAT debate. Now, who is the GOAT that is all dependent on your preferences? There's no specific right or wrong answer. You know, some guys go with Bill Russell because he's won the most championships in history. Some guys go with Will Chamberlain because statistically he's so brilliant. Kareem because he's got the most MVPs. Magic Johnson because he's the best playmaker. Larry Bird for his all-round game. But most people choose between Michael Jordan and modern great LeBron James. And that is what this video today is focused around. Michael Jordan or LeBron James. Now, this is a video that's been recommended by many of you. Apparently, this is the best breakdown on YouTube. So I thought this would be a very, very fun video for us to react to together. So without any further delay, let's get right into it. Can't wait for this one. When you're good at something, you'll tell everyone. When you're great at something, they'll tell you. Now, ain't that the truth? Ain't that the damn truth? Here we're seeing Michael Jordan coming out to the court. LeBron James with his famous pre-game ritual. Ooh, two of the all-time greats. This should be good. MJ laying it up against the Indiana Pacers. Not laying it up, dunking it, should I say. <laughs> LeBron James doing the same to Atlanta. This should be good. This should be good. Hmm, there's Michael Jordan with his defensive prowess. Led the league in steals in multiple years. Let's not forget, he's not just a scorer. Oh yeah. Jordan versus LeBron. The definitive GOAT analysis. Jordan versus LeBron. LeBron versus Jordan. It's a debate that has captured the public's attention for the last several years, especially after this moment in 2016, hmm? when LeBron James beat the Golden State Warriors to win the third championship of his career. In LeBron's own words, That one so right there made me the greatest player of all time. That's so what I felt. I Interesting. Like, Interesting. That one right there made you the greatest player of all time. But did it? Is everything since that moment simply icing on LeBron's cake? Or is LeBron destined to finish his career in Michael Jordan's shadow? We've all heard the arguments from LeBron supporters. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster, he's more durable. And from Jordan supporters. Michael Jordan was merely 6-0 and oh with six MVPs in the finals. But the GOAT debate isn't as simple as the pundits make it seem. There are a number of factors relevant in determining the greatest basketball player of all time. In fact, I would say there are five things that really matter when determining the GOAT of any sport. These criteria are, in no particular order, accomplishments, longevity, winning, statistics, and what we'll refer to in this video as the eye test. Okay, so this is interesting. So he's breaking it down on these five categories. Quickly, guys, you at home, where would you rank LeBron versus Michael in these five categories? Accomplishments, I'd probably go Michael. Longevity, I'd probably go LeBron. Winning. I probably go Michael. Statistics really depends what you value more. Do you value scoring or do you value playmaking or do you value an all round game? That can go either one. And I think the eye test, you know, who's visually the best can also go either way. So I think the first three are very clear to describe who wins what. The last two are the ones where I'm a little bit fuzzy. And to be the GOAT, you don't need to be the best in any specific category but you need to be pretty good across the board. So simply winning seven championships, like Robert Ory did, isn't enough to get you into the conversation. No, no doubt, no when doubt. When we finish with this video, it'll be plainly obvious that one guy comes out on top. But before we get started, I wanna clarify that this is not a comparison of legacies. It's about who was the better basketball player. If we were talking about legacies, Jordan's is nearly untouchable, not only did he lead basketball to global popularity, he helped transform Nike into an empire, changed the way players played and how they dressed, and he even made it cool for guys to be bald. <laughs> and while those things certainly contribute to MJ's iconic status, they don't make him a better player on the court. 
So let's evaluate the criteria that matter, and we'll start with individual accomplishments. Take a look. Jordan had more regular season MVPs, twice as many finals MVPs, nine more scoring titles, and several more selections to the NBA's all-defensive team. Hey guys, just one thing to note, just so we're always fair to LeBron James throughout this video, it's clear that this video is made slightly before LeBron won his fourth championship. So there where it says finals MVPs, LeBron should have four. And at the all-star selection team, LeBron's now nearing 20. If he gets selected this year, he will have 20. So this video is slightly outdated, but just remember that LeBron has won four championships to Michael Jordan six. Including once being named Defensive Player of the Year. LeBron has more All-Star appearances, but that's largely due to his having played more seasons. In fact, when taking into account retirements and major injuries, Jordan essentially played 13 seasons compared to 17 seasons for LeBron, making Jordan's significant lead in accomplishments all the more impressive. Yeah, that's true. And that's to say nothing of MJ's brilliant college career, which saw him twice named All-American and once awarded College Player of the Year, at a time when the country's best players actually went to college. So regardless of whether you're a LeBron fan or MJ fan, you have to give the accomplishments checkmark to Jordan. Without the doubt, I agree with that. I agree with that. This is longevity. And this one is also a no-brainer, but this time in favor of LeBron. Yep. Not only has LeBron played more seasons in the league, but he's had a longer peak than Jordan. Yep. Jordan's peak lasted about 10 years, whereas LeBron's peak has lasted 16 years and is still going. <laughs> and he's been incredibly durable during that time, missing significant time to injury only in 2019. That said, the claim that LeBron has been much more durable than Michael has been a bit overblown. Consider that Jordan played in at least 80 regular season games 11 times in his career. Yeah, that's mad. all 82 games an incredible nine times. Compare that to LeBron, who played in at least 80 regular season games just twice, and in all 82 games just once. So both LeBron and Jordan get high marks for their durability. But right. durability aside, the bottom line is that LeBron has sustained his level of excellence for a much longer period of time than Jordan, which puts the longevity check mark squarely on LeBron's corner. So far, I'm in full agreement. That brings us to the third GOAT criteria, winning. As we all know, I've got Michael. Jordan won six championships. LeBron has won three. Jordan is 6-0 and in the NBA Finals. LeBron is 3-6. and six. Four and yes, six. Yes, LeBron has made the Finals nine times compared to only six times for Jordan. But let's not pretend that making the finals is the same thing, or even close to the same thing, as winning a title. Take a prime example from another sport, the Buffalo Bills. They're the only team in NFL history to appear in four consecutive Super Bowls. But is there a single player or fan of that team that wouldn't trade all four of those appearances for just one Super Bowl win? That's unreal. Frankly, talk to any fan whose team lost the season's final game and ask them how they felt afterward. Almost universally, their feelings are of sadness, anger and disappointment and that's just the fans for that's players, the beauty of sport guys only magnified listen to charles barkley talk about losing in the nba finals and i was just in shock when it was over because uh i had to uh i was frustrated because i couldn't wheel my team past michael and the bulls and it first of all i probably think i don't think i've ever gotten over it number one but that was traumatic and it's just it, it's painful guys charles barkley is one of my favorite not just sportsmen of all time but media personalities i really do wish that he at least had one nba championship so Shaq and the boys couldn't make fun of him but you know that's that sport there's highs and lows it's it's the greatest live drama in the world and that's what makes it beautiful but yeah i wish charles barkley at least had one championship so we can all stop with this false equivalence between winning the championship and finishing runner-up in the words of herm edwards you play to win the game <laughs> hello <laughs> you play to win the game plain and simple man Back to jordan and lebron as mentioned, on basketball's biggest stage, the NBA Finals, Jordan was 6-0, LeBron was 3-6. And, and frankly, that doesn't even show how lopsided their records really are. In terms of individual Finals games, Jordan was 24-11, LeBron is 18-31, and, and that's because in four of his six Finals losses, LeBron's team hasn't even been competitive. 
twice he got swept, and two other times he lost four games to one. That includes being on the wrong side of the two most lopsided finals by margin of loss in NBA history. Damn. Of course, LeBron fans will tell you that the only reason for LeBron's poor finals record is that his competition was so tough. Ironically, some of these same fans criticized Jordan for losing early in his career to a Celtics team stacked with five Hall of Famers, <laughs> and they conveniently gloss over the fact that LeBron reached the finals so many times in part because the competition in his own conference was so weak. During the vast majority of his career, LeBron played in what many dubbed the Leastern Conference because the East was so much weaker than the West. On the other hand, during Jordan's playing days, the East was generally considered the stronger conference. It was stacked. As Jordan had to battle through hard-fought rivalries against the Bad Boy Pistons, Patrick Ewing's Knicks, the Shaq Penny-led Magic, and Reggie Miller's Pacers. That said, if you want to blame LeBron's failure in the finals on the level of his competition, I won't argue with you. But let's also not blow it out of proportion. If you look at the average number of wins of their finals opponents, you'll see that LeBron's finals opponents averaged 60.8 wins per season, whereas Jordan's finals opponents averaged 61.2 wins per season. So as it turns This is now a deep dive into the stats, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you've ever delved into the stats like this, but I certainly haven't. This is definitely an interesting perspective on things. And by the way, if you are enjoying this GOAT debate as of now, please remember to like and subscribe. It definitely helps the channel out, but back to the video we go. Turns out, both players face stiff competition in the finals. But a big reason we don't hold the 93 Suns, the 96 Sonics, or the 98 Jazz in the same regard as some of LeBron's finals opponents is because, unlike LeBron's adversaries, Jordan's opponents never actually won the Larry O'Brien Trophy. Which goes to my original point, that the difference between winning the title and finishing runner-up is huge. And the reason those teams never won the title? This guy. No doubt. Look, I'm not trying to say that Jordan's opponents were as good as the Warriors teams that LeBron faced four times in the finals. The truth is that Jordan never played a juggernaut quite like that. But there's a pretty good reason for that. Jordan. Although I will, I'll counter a little bit, that Utah Jazz team with Karl Malone and John Stockton was damn near one of the greatest teams to never win an NBA title. And, you know, Jordan's Bulls had to beat them twice in the finals. So, you know. Just something to think about. Jordan's Bulls were the juggernaut. They were the team winning 70 plus games. They were the team with the target on their back every year. And as the Warriors showed us, that's not an easy place to be. As great as the Warriors were, they were never able to string together three consecutive championships. Jordan's Bulls did it twice. So what's the greater achievement? Beating the juggernaut or being the juggernaut? Or to be more specific, beating the juggernaut one time out of the four times he faced them or being the juggernaut year after year after year and then doing it again year after year after year there's no doubt that lebron's victory over the 73 win warriors was the highlight of his career but it's not the first time that an underdog has won the championship and there actually have been much bigger underdogs who ended up winning the title but how many times have we seen a player lead his team to six championships in eight years Prior to Jordan's Bulls, only Bill Russell's Celtics ever accomplished that feat in the NBA when yep. they incredibly won 11 championships in 13 seasons. That's still a crazy However, stat. Back then, there was an average of less than 10 teams in the league and only yep. a couple rounds of playoffs, so it was mm. considerably easier to win a title. That's no true. No player, not even Bill Russell, ever had a run of winning 25 of 26 playoff series as Michael Jordan did. And Michael's pattern of winning goes beyond the NBA. Let's not forget that Jordan has never won anything but gold in the Olympics, <laughs> and he also earned an NCAA championship, in which he hit the first of two iconic championship winning shots in his career. Dude, this guy just won from All beginning to say, end. When it comes to winning, the check mark clearly goes to Jordan. That one can be no doubt. On to the fourth GOAT that can be That can be no statistics. doubt. This one is a bit more complicated. Yep. I mean, how do you statistically evaluate two players who played in different eras under different rules at different positions? One way of doing it is to simply look at the eight traditional statistics of basketball. Points, assists, rebounds, steals, blocks, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, and turnovers. And we'll focus on per game stats rather than cumulative stats, since cumulative stats such as total career points and total career assists really speak to longevity, which is already its own category of the GOAT analysis. 
per game stats on the other hand, is more of an apples to apples comparison. So looking at the eight traditional stats, we see that Jordan leads LeBron in five of them, points per game, steals per game, blocks per game, free throw percentage, and fewer turnovers. LeBron leads in the other three, assists per game, rebounds per game, and field goal percentage. Okay, so I think this is a good place to pause it and just evaluate uh, the statistics here. So points per game, that's straightforward. Michael Jordan was a, a better scorer, although LeBron James himself is an amazing scorer. Um, assists, yes, LeBron James did play a, more of a playmaking role. He definitely rebounded the ball more. Uh, Michael Jordan was one of the best stealers of a ball during his era. Blocks, uh, they're, they're pretty much the same. No, neither LeBron James or Michael Jordan are known as prolific blockers. Obviously, LeBron James has those famous blocks that he has um, accumulated over his career, especially that one against Golden State in 2016 NBA Final. Field goal percentage, clearly not a lot in that one. Free throw percentage, I don't, I don't know if, if, if your free throw percentage should really count towards being the GOAT. You know, I don't know if that's enough of a statistics. And then turnovers, clearly Michael Jordan has less turnovers than LeBron James. Although to be fair to LeBron James, he does carry the ball more, you know, by looking at the fact that he's got so many more assists than Michael Jordan, he's bound to have more turnovers because he carries the ball in the court a lot more than Michael Jordan. So just, just breaking that, down those, that's my analysis so far by looking at that. It'll be interesting to see what the video creator has to say. But that's a pretty simplistic way of looking at statistics. What if we instead turn to analytics? Probably the most well-known analytics stat is player efficiency rating, yeah. or PER for short. This metric was created by respected basketball analyst John Hollinger to give an overall rating to a player's performance based on traditional stats like the ones we just mentioned. Jordan has led the league in PER seven times, LeBron six times. Jordan has finished top three in PER ten times, LeBron nine times. In fact, Jordan has the highest career PER in both the regular season and the playoffs. Another popular analytics stat is win shares. Jordan has led the league in win shares eight times, LeBron five times. Jordan has finished top three in win shares 11 times, LeBron six times. And when it comes to win shares per 48 minutes, Jordan has the highest career rating in both the regular season and the playoffs. That's crazy. What about box That's plus crazy. minus? Until recently, LeBron was actually ahead of Jordan in career box plus minus. But after the 2017 season gave Russell Westbrook the greatest single season box plus minus in history by a wide margin, the architect of box plus minus realized that the stat was fundamentally flawed. So he made some changes to improve its formula. As a result, Michael Jordan now has the highest career box plus minus in both the regular season and the playoffs. Hmm. And lastly, what about value over replacement player? which on its face seems to favor LeBron James. Well, value over replacement player is a cumulative stat. And as previously noted, cumulative stats speak more to longevity than they do game to game dominance. That said, according to value over replacement player, Jordan owns six of the nine greatest individual seasons ever played. And on a per game basis, MJ's career rating in value over replacement player is the highest of all time in both the regular season and the playoffs. Are you noticing a theme here? Not only does Jordan beat LeBron in every ratable analytics stat, he consistently ranks as the best ever across the board. Damn. Before we move on from analytics. I that was, first of all, that was a deep dive into the stats, ladies and gentlemen. I've never ever gone that deep into the analytics to compare these two players. And it's quite crazy that Michael Jordan features number one in all of those definitely surprising i would have thought that lebron james would have been higher in some of them but in all the deep analytics it seems like michael jordan has led not just against lebron james but against the whole league in all time i want to mention a lesser known stat called game score another brainchild of john hollinger Game score measures a player's performance in a single game, so it won't tell us who's had the better career, but it does provide insight into who's had the greatest games. Now, we only have game score stats since 1983, so you won't see any mentions of Wilt Chamberlain here. That said, of the 100 highest game scores ever recorded, incredibly 19 of them belong to Michael Jordan. In other words, nearly one out of every five of the best single game performances over the last four decades has been by MJ. 
That includes the highest game score of all time for Jordan's 69.18 rebound masterpiece. Comparatively, LeBron has had only three of the top 100 game scores. When discussing the GOAT, Nick Wright is fond of asking this question. The aliens come down. You have one game to save humanity. Who's your first pick in the history of the world? Well, Nick, Michael Jordan. we have our answer. <laughs> now that I've finished drowning you in numbers, let's be real. Hardly anyone watching this video knows how to calculate PER, win shares, box plus minus, value of a replacement player, or game score. And why should you? This is basketball, not goodwill hunting. So let's go back to the traditional stats that we all know and understand. But this time, let's add context to them. What do I mean by context? Well, some positions are simply better than others at racking up certain stats. Let's take rebounding as an example. In a vacuum, if we simply compare the number of rebounds per game of Brook Lopez and Jason Kidd, we might think that Lopez was the better rebounder. The truth is, relative to their positions, Lopez is statistically one of the worst rebounding centers in NBA history, whereas Kidd is statistically one of the best rebounding guards in NBA history. Uh. But even a poor rebounding center can grab more rebounds than a great rebounding guard solely by virtue of their roles on the court. So it makes sense that, to understand the context of a player's stats, we should compare them to the respective positions that they played. That's so a really good LeBron point. James to the other small forwards who have played at least 500 NBA games, this is where he ranks. Overall, that's pretty impressive. Now let's see how Jordan compares to all shooting guards who have played at least 500 NBA games. As Damn. good as LeBron is compared to other small forwards, Jordan is on another Damn. level when compared to other shooting guards. He's darn near the top of every major statistical category. And there isn't a single category where LeBron is better than MJ relative to his position, other than assists. So to sum up statistics, whether comparing traditional stats or analytics, and especially when judging these players in the context of the positions they played, Jordan has a noticeable edge over LeBron. As such, we have to give the check mark to Jordan. And that takes us to the last category in our GOAT analysis the eye test. And to be clear, by eye test, I don't mean which of these players is bigger, faster, or jumps higher. None of that is relevant unless we're having a track and field competition. And frankly, if physical measurables mattered, then George Murison would be in the GOAT conversation. <laughs> no, what I mean by the eye test is, if you sat an average basketball fan in front of a TV to watch a player in action, what would he notice that the player is and is not great at? Thankfully, I happen to be an average basketball fan. Guys, the problem I have with the eye test is I don't feel like it's a good enough measure for judging who the greatest is. You know, I feel like the eye test doesn't do justice to people that contribute to winning basketball. You know, some players are not necessarily pretty on the eye in terms of their execution, but they get the job done. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. So I don't typically agree with you know, using the eye test as a measure to um, measure greatness. But either way, we'll, I'll be interested to hear what he has to say about it. And I've had the privilege of watching both LeBron and Jordan during their playing days. So unlike a lot of my fellow YouTubers, I haven't merely relied on highlight videos. Here's what my eyes told me when I saw Michael Jordan play, particularly during his playing days with the Chicago Bulls. He was the best offensive player in the game, he was arguably the best defensive player in the game. Yep. He had the best mid-range game. He was the best finisher at the rim. He had the best post-up game, which is incredible considering most players who dominated the post were big men. He was widely considered the most clutch player in the game. He was regarded by opponents as the fiercest competitor on the court. He was regarded by teammates as the hardest worker in practice. And when all was said and done, amongst the other stars of his generation, he was the greatest winner. Now, when you're playing against the elite of the elite athletes of the world, to be the best at any one of those things is pretty remarkable. But to be the best at all of them, <laughs> I tell you, it's impossible. But for the fact that we saw Michael Jordan do it. This is one of my favorite Michael Jordan moments. Debate, that's the biggest hurdle facing LeBron. He's basically being compared to a guy who was great at everything and practically had no weaknesses. Seriously, judging by the eye test, what's the worst thing we could say about Michael Jordan's game? Probably that he wasn't a very good three-point shooter. Jordan shot 33% from beyond the arc in an era when the average player also shot 33%. So when it came to three-point shooting, he wasn't good, he wasn't bad, he was just average. 
But remember that Michael played in an age when the three-point shot wasn't a big part of the game. During Jordan's years, teams averaged only 9.5 three-point attempts per game, and Michael himself attempted less than two threes per game. And if being an average three-point shooter is a weakness of Michael's game, well, then we also have to call it a weakness of LeBron's game. The difference is that LeBron plays in an era where the three-point shot is a huge part of the game. During the years in which LeBron played, teams attempted on average over 21 threes per game, and LeBron himself averaged 4.3 three-point attempts per game, or two and a half times as many as Jordan. Despite the increased emphasis on threes, LeBron's career shooting percentage from beyond the arc is only a hair better than Jordan, at 34%. And it's actually slightly below his peers, who averaged 35% from three during his era. But to reiterate, being an average three-point shooter was by far the worst part of MJ's game. For LeBron, it's not even close. LeBron, in fact, has four major weaknesses as a basketball player, each of which is readily apparent to anyone who has actually watched him play. First, he's not a good free throw shooter. For his career, LeBron has shot around 73.5% from the free throw line, which is pretty poor for a player who handles the ball as much as he does. In fact, many analysts point out that at the end of games, LeBron shies away from driving to the basket because he's afraid of being sent to the line. I don't know whether that's true, but what I do know is that the odds of LeBron hitting two consecutive free throws is statistically not much better than a coin flip. Jordan, on the other hand, shot a solid 83.5% from the free throw line during the no his look free throw. <laughs> and MJ never shied away from contact at the end of games. LeBron's second weakness is that he's an inconsistent defender. Sure, he's had some years where he was elite defensively, which is evidenced by his numerous selections to the NBA's all-defensive team, but he's also had several years where he's practically been a liability on the defensive end. Compare that to MJ, who during his Bulls days was a consistently elite defender. In fact, Jordan is the only player to rank in the top five amongst all guards in both steals per game and blocks per game for his career. Additionally, Michael led his position in defensive win shares practically every year that he played for the Bulls, an incredible 10 times. LeBron, comparatively, has led his position in defensive win shares on just four occasions, and in five of his last seven seasons, he didn't even crack the top 10 at his position in defensive win shares. Now, some will excuse LeBron's recent falloff on the defensive end as a byproduct of his resting on defense so that he can have more energy on offense, and we can debate the merits of that strategy. But resting on defense is not something Michael Jordan was ever accused of. I think to be fair to LeBron, he's now playing at a time where you know Michael Jordan couldn't get to. LeBron James is in his 21st NBA season, so clearly he needs to rest his body somewhat in order to carry on these seasons. But during his prime, LeBron James was definitely one of the best defenders in the league. You know, he's a seven-time more defensive member uh you know his first team all defense four times the only problem is michael jordan was the best defending guard of his era and probably the best defending guard of all time you know winning all defensive first team honors nine times he was defensive player of the year on one occasion so michael jordan was definitely the best defender when comparing michael jordan and lebron james but you got to give lebron james some sort of slack because he's clearly resting his body in his later years so he can contribute more on the offensive side of doing heck even as a 40 year old he was busting his tail on the defensive end but what about the notion that lebron's been the more versatile defender LeBron supporters will argue that he can guard positions 1 through 5 on the court, such as when he guarded Derrick Rose for stretches in the 2011 playoffs. But LeBron's guarding the opposing team's point guard or center isn't something that happens very often. In fact, during his career, LeBron has spent less than 5% of his total minutes guarding the opposing players 1 or 5. So the versatility argument is highly exaggerated. And look, when it comes to versatility, Hometown Buffet may have a more versatile menu than Spago. That doesn't make it a better restaurant. <laughs> LeBron's third weakness is that he's not a very good shooter. And this is a pretty significant flaw for someone claiming to be the GOAT. I mean, shooting the ball is the quintessential skill in the game of basketball. It's the part of the game that everyone practices, whether on the playground, at the YMCA, or in the NBA. Now, some people will contend that LeBron is actually a better shooter than Jordan because he has a better career field goal percentage. And yes, LeBron's career field goal percentage is 50.4% compared to Jordan's Barely higher. Barely higher. But recall what I said about placing stats into proper context. 
To help us understand context when it comes to shooting, allow me to introduce DeAndre Jordan and Tyson Chandler. We all know that DeAndre and Tyson were great rebounders and defenders, but what if I told you that they were also two of the greatest shooters of all time? That would be certifiably crazy. Yet if you look at all the shooting metrics, field goal percentage, effective field goal percentage, true shooting percentage, both of these guys rank near the top in NBA history. Of course, there's an obvious reason for that. As we all know, both DeAndre Jordan and Tyson Chandler take a lot of their shot attempts on dunks, layups, and putbacks, which are extremely high percentage shots. Well, guess what? So does LeBron James. In fact, every single year of his career, the shot that LeBron James has taken the most has been within 0-3 to three feet from the basket. In other words, dunks, layups, and putbacks. More than one of every three of LeBron's shots has been within this point-blank range, which is aided by his playing in an era where it's been relatively easy to get to the rim, particularly when compared to the physical era in which Jordan played. And just like every other player, LeBron is really effective from 0-3 to three feet, hitting over 73% of these shots. But how does LeBron fare from outside this range? According to BasketballReference.com, LeBron's shooting percentage from outside 3 feet is 37.5%. It's even poorer in the playoffs where he shoots 35.9%. And it gets even worse in close and late situations. In the last two minutes of games where the score is within five points, LeBron hits only 31.7% of his jumpers. Look, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that these numbers aren't very good, which is probably why in the 2013 finals, the Spurs defensive strategy against the Heat was to basically dare LeBron James to shoot. And keep in mind, this was against LeBron in his prime. Can you imagine an opposing coach using a similar strategy against <laughs> MJ? Never. Now, LeBron actually credits the Spurs for forcing him to work on his jump shot, but it's not as if his results have gotten much better since then. Here's LeBron's shooting percentage from outside three feet over the last six years. Yikes. Well, I'll give him this, he is consistent. For comparison, consider that in the last year of Michael Jordan's career, as an aging player on the Washington Wizards, Jordan shot close to 42% from outside three feet. While that's certainly not great, it means that even as a 40-year-old shell of his former self, Jordan was still a better shooter, a far better shooter, than LeBron James. Unfortunately, Basketball Reference doesn't have advanced shooting metrics from Michael's Bulls days when he was a significantly more efficient scorer, but few would argue that Michael was anything but a lethal jump shooter when he was wearing red and black. When it comes to shooting, all of us can recall practicing shots on the blacktop, counting down three, two, one, before launching a shot at the rim. Well, if you were pretending to be LeBron James, you'd brick almost two-thirds of the time. Actually, that's not entirely true. If you were playing against a countdown, it would be much, much worse. And that gets me to the last major weakness of LeBron's game, his performance, or more accurately, lack of performance, in the clutch. Remember when people were praising LeBron for making a couple of buzzer beaters in the playoffs two years ago? They used these stats to claim that LeBron was better in the clutch than Jordan. Wait, let me just read those quickly. Field goals, field goals attempted. Okay, so they mildly support LeBron James. But look at these numbers carefully. What stands out to you? How about this? People were using a sample size of less than one shot per season to make the case that LeBron was more clutch than Jordan. That would be the equivalent of polling just 100 people in the country to try to predict the winner of the next presidential election. So let's use more telling stats, shall we? Here's a situation that's often used to determine a player's clutchness. Five seconds to go in the fourth quarter or overtime, and your team needs a bucket to either win or tie the game. It answers the age-old question, who do you want taking the last shot with the game on the line? It turns out that in the regular season and playoffs combined, LeBron has taken 94 such shots. That's a pretty good sample size. And how many of those 94 shots has LeBron made? 19, for a shooting percentage of 20%. Let me repeat that, 20%. Guys, that's not bad in the clutch. That's atrocious. Michael okay, what's Jordan what's Michael situation? what's Michael Jordan's shot roughly 50%. Yes, that's right. Jordan's performance under pressure 
was the same as it was throughout the rest of the game. Damn. And that, my friends, is damn. the definition of damn. Rich. Damn, damn, damn. So there you go. When it comes to the eye test, our eyes tell us that one player, Michael Jordan, is great at everything and has practically no weaknesses. And the other player, LeBron James, while also having a ton of strengths, has several obvious flaws to his game. And when all is said and done, after analyzing the five key factors of being the GOAT, Jordan gets four check marks to LeBron's one, making this GOAT debate, well, not much of a debate at all. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that LeBron James is a bad player. He's a phenomenal player. Personally, I have him on basketball's Mount Rushmore, along with Jordan, Kareem, Will Chamberlain, and Bill Russell. He's just not Michael Jordan. And just to Wait, isn't the Mount Rushmore only supposed to have four, four names? Underscore how good MJ was, let's ignore LeBron and Jordan for a minute and focus on the other three players highlighted here, Kareem, Wilt, and Bill Russell. Most would agree that these are the three greatest centers in NBA history, and each of them has a strong case to justify his standing among basketball royalty. Wilt is an all-time great because he was an offensive force of nature, and he holds a ton of NBA records. Russell is in the conversation because he was a dominant defender and a perennial champion. Kareem also led his team to numerous titles, and in terms of individual awards and accolades, was the most decorated of the three. Not to mention, he had the NBA's most unguardable shot. Now imagine a center that had all the best qualities from these three titans. A player like that would be the basketball equivalent of Thanos. Now add to that player the highest level of intangible attributes, such as a tireless work ethic, unmatched killer instinct, and an ability to deliver in the clutch. And now you'd essentially be looking at Thanos with all of the Infinity Stones. And no one would question whether this player was the greatest of all time. Let me guess, but this is Michael is, Jordan? We don't have to imagine such a player. That player already existed. He just happened to be a shooting guard, not a center. When you think about it, Michael Jordan is the real life version of an overpowered video game character. <laughs> he had all the qualities we look for in a superstar athlete, and he had it in spades. He's basically Babe Ruth, if Babe Ruth played defense like Willie Mays. And that's why, even in comparison to the other all-time greats, he is truly in a class of his own. Simply put, he's the GOAT. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I give you a hand, sir. I give you a hand. Very comprehensive analysis, indeed. Well, folks, that is the video. That is the GOAT debate between Michael Jordan and LeBron James. Now, clearly, that is simply from one person's perspective, but he broke it down as thoroughly as I've ever seen someone break it down before. This is why that particular video was so well recommended. And yeah, I've never seen, you know, the advanced analytics, you know, uh, being ventured into as much as it was. And it was definitely eye-opening to say the least. Um, I've always thought that Michael Jordan's the best player of all time. This almost just confirms it. But, you know, I'd be interested to hear what your opinions on this matter are. I know there's so many you know intense basketball fans that watch these videos so hearing your opinions or seeing your opinions in the comments would be much appreciated i'm definitely going to comment and reply down below but yeah folks i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did and if you did please remember to like and subscribe it definitely helps out the channel a lot but yeah folks that's all i have for you today so until next time i hope you have a good one cheers